So what I'm going to talk about today, uh, since the Moody Garden guys kind of already talked about the aquarium chemistry, I'm going to talk about a couple of products that help us uh, maintain that chemistry, um, such as uh, like bio pellets, vodka dosing, uh, different things like that. A um, little introduction about myself. Uh, like I said, I'll talk about like the overview of aquarium chemistry, a couple of important facts, uh, why it's important to understand it, the nitrogen cycle, uh, go into a little bit of that, uh, effects of nitrates and phosphates on the inhabitants of our tanks, and uh, a little bit about the actual bacteria that everybody talks about the bacteria and the nitrogen cycle. So I figured I'd kind of go a little in depth about what those bacteria actually are. Um, and then I'll kind of get into the, the, the products themselves, the bio pellets, uh, Zeovit, Perdivio, and even some uh, vodka dosing. So a little bit about me. Started the hobby years ago, uh, probably like a lot of you guys. Um, I did get a bachelor's degree in marine biology from Texas A&M uh, in Galveston. Um, I was one class short of a minor in chemistry. and. I would have had it, but I'd have to drive all the way up to the main campus, and it just wasn't worth it for me. So, a little bit short on that, but I still have to agree. Um, I have worked for Moody Gardens. Uh, I was actually in their education department, so I didn't get exactly the same exposure that uh, the other two gentlemen have uh, with the livestock, but uh, I did get to kind of see the ins and outs of, of the buildings. Uh, I did work at Bay Area Aquarium Fish Store for a while. Uh, they're no longer in existence. Um, but if you have the ability to, I suggest highly that everybody work at a fish store. There's so much knowledge that you can gain just by opening up a box of fish and, and seeing how everything is. It's it's a good learning experience. You know whether or not you know you, you like it or love it or whatever. I mean, it, it's still a good experience. Um, I like to take a lot of photography, uh, a lot of photographs, so most of the photos in this show are mostly from me. Um, a couple I've pulled off the net just because I have access to some of them. Um, I'm an overactive blogger. Uh, I run the Aquanerd blog, which I've been doing for a couple years now. Uh, it's pretty busy. I get pretty good, you know, pretty good articles on there, and I think that are pretty helpful. Um, I've got an intense passion for the hobby, and Again, most, of, most people in this room probably do, but there's a lot of people out there who really don't. They just they see something, oh, let's toss it in the tank, see what happens. Um, you really have to understand and have a, a, a desire to learn about your tank and a desire to actually see what's going on. Um, right now, I'm, I'm currently working in the petrochemical industry. I do a lot of testing. I actually use some of the same instruments that's out on the table right now, such as uh, the Hawk test meter. We've got one of those at my job. Uh, we test nitrates and phosphates and silicates and stuff like that from processed water. So uh, it's very, very similar chemistry, even though it's not exactly the same product that we're looking at. So the overview. Uh, why is chemistry important? Uh, so I guess the, the real explanation is it determines if we're successful. You can feed fish all day long. You can give them the best food that money can buy. You can have the best equipment. You can have the most awesome lighting. But it all boils down to chemistry. If you have ammonia in your water, if you have nitrites in your water, it doesn't matter what kind of light you have, your fish aren't going to do very well, your corals aren't going to do very well. Um, within our tanks, there's just a constant process that's, you know, you get ammonia that, that's, that comes in every day. So every day your aquarium is essentially cycling because it's every day is striving to get rid of that ammonia load, it's trying to get rid of that nitrite. And so it's always happening. Um, most aquarium livestock is fairly sensitive to parameter fluctuations. Um, some fish can handle it more than others, damselfish, chromis, stuff like that. They're obviously very hardy, uh, but different invertebrates, different corals, different fish, some of them just don't handle it very well. Um, and for the reef keeping guys, uh, coral growth is actually tied directly to phosphate levels and the color is tied fairly closely to, to nitrate. So, um, it's important to kind of know what all these processes are doing in your tank, and it's, it's also very important to find out how to get rid of them, how to get rid of the nitrates, how to get rid of the phosphates. Um, I'll talk about the salt here in a minute. Next slide. Um, 
here's just kind of a general overview of the nitrogen cycle. Um, most everybody here has seen it. Most everybody here kind of has a really good grasp of what's happening. Um, basically, in a nutshell, you have organic matter in your aquarium. It's decaying. Different things are, are eating it. Different things are feeding off of it. And it's going to put out ammonia. The bacteria are going to convert that ammonia to nitrite. And then you have some come in that convert it to nitrate. Um, usually, ammonia and nitrite are handled in the tank. Nitrates are typically manually removed. Um, that's just kind of a, a general broad spectrum overview. Um, like I kind of hinted at earlier, we have many cycles in our aquariums on a constant basis. Anytime you add food, not all of it's going to get eaten. Anytime you have a fish, it's going to excrete some kind of waste that's going to, you know, put out some kind of ammonia or something. About as the direct effects of nitrogen and phosphorus in the tank. Um, most people see these as a source for algae growth. A lot of algae are going to consume these these elements or these compounds rather. Um, they're going to get all kinds of different algae growth. Um, I'm not sure what the top one is. It's actually some from Galveston Bay. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been in a botany class, so uh, forgive me on that one. Uh, the, the middle one is Bologna bubble algae, something we encounter in our tanks on a fairly regular basis. Um, the name itself kind of describes what's going on. It's just a bubble of algae. Uh, it contains fluid. It grows rather rapidly. Some of the bubbles can get pretty sizable. Um, that's my index finger for reference on those, but some of them can actually get, you know, pretty sizable. Um, the bottom algae is uh, hair algae, uh, some species of hair algae, not exactly sure which one. Uh, there's a couple of corals kind of sitting in that little patch of algae, so obviously the, they're being choked out, they're, they're, they're not doing very well. So the nitrate that we experience in our aquariums primarily comes as a byproduct of the nitrogen cycle. Like I was saying, the ammonia and the nitrite are eventually broken down into nitrate, and some of that gets broken down into nitrogen gas. Uh, through some anaerobic processes, but for the most part, we're going to see nitrates uh, coming from com coming from this nitrogen cycle. Um, they typically don't have a, a big effect on fish unless it gets to I don't know, 100 ppm or so. Most tanks usually don't get make it that far, but but they do. Um, so fish can be affected by it. Um, what you're typically going to see is algae growth or brown corals. So um, the, the nitrate itself is going to be fueling all sorts of algae growth, and the algae that's in the corals, as those in Theli, are going to be feeding off of it as well. And what's going to happen is they're going to concentrate a lot, you know, where you can see them, and it's going to just be brown coloration. So if you want to have healthier, better looking corals, uh, nitrate's going to be one of the guys you want to get out of there. Um, phosphate, uh, multiple sources of phosphate, they can come from uh, your salt, they can come from foods, they can come from additives, they can come from your sand, they can come from media, from a calcium rack, they can come from all sorts of places. Um, there's several different forms, there's inorganic, there's organic. Uh, most of what our test kits are going to read are going to be inorganic. Um, kind of went over the sources. Uh, elevated phosphate levels uh, promote algae growth as well, but at a certain point they actually start to inhibit calcification. So if you have an SPS coral dominated tank or even anything that has a calcium skeleton, they're going to grow slower at elevated concentrations and then eventually it's going to get to the point where they stop growing at all. They're gonna, they may look healthy, they may still show polyp extension, you know, what have you, but they're not going to grow very good. They're not going to grow sometimes at all. Um, there's a million different methods of removal, either chemical or physical. Uh, water changes are Probably one that, that gets overlooked a lot just because everybody wants to do it the easy way, everybody wants to do it the, the less intense way. So um, for that route, there's, there's chemical media, there's uh, different different things of that nature. Um, so everybody talks about the cycle, everybody talks about everything uh, regarding nitrogen and phosphorus, but most people don't actually ever talk about the nitrogen, uh, I'm sorry, the bacteria. And they, they use the term bacteria, but the thing is there's so many different bacteria that are, that are occurring in our tanks. There's so many different bacteria that are breaking different things down that it's somewhat important to know what, to what's going in to your tank. Um, there's also a lot of products that specifically dose bacteria. So again, like I said, it's, it's 
it's ideal to know what's, what's happening. It's ideal to know what you're putting in your aquarium. Um, there's six different genuses that occur in marine environments that either oxidize or uh, either oxidize ammonia or oxidize nitrogen or nitrite. Um, a couple different genuses up here. Uh, the nitro nitrosophires are going to be breaking down your ammonia into nitrite, and then your nitrifying bacteria are going to be breaking that nitrite down into nitrate, and then the denitrification process is where nitrates are broken down into nitrogen gas. It usually just forms in little bubbles in your sand bed. Um, basically, a little typo there. Um, like I said, they serve as the heart and soul of the aquarium cycle. Uh, there's different products and techniques that either boost their populations or, or you know, they, they feed the bacteria. They help maintain a good steady bacteria population. So if you ever encounter something where like a fish dies and you're getting just an intense amount of waste being dumped into your aquarium, that the bacteria will be able to process that more quickly. So one of those medias is bio pellets. Um, they're very popular right now. Everybody's making a reactor specifically designed to, to house a, the bio pellet. Um, basically, the bio pellet itself is a synthetic polymer and it's grown from bacteria. So a different type of bacteria is placed in a certain medium and that bacteria produces these polyhydroalkanoates at a very fairly high rate. Um, the, this compound is a biodegradable and biocompatible plastic, meaning uh, it will break down in our aquariums, but it's not harmful. The bacteria feed off of it. It's going to serve as a food source to both aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. Um, and what this does is, like I said, it, it increases these bacteria populations. And when an event happens, when you feed too much, when, a, when something dies or when something's not doing very well, they can consume the nitrates and the phosphates fairly quickly and just kind of maintain a stable, stable environment. Uh, the bio pellets themselves are not a source of bacteria. There's some products out there that are specifically designed to add bacteria to your system, but these are mostly just the food source. Um, this is sort of a picture of what the pellets look like. Uh, there's different varieties. They come in different shapes and sizes. Um, there's really not one that's better than the other. A lot of them are just repackaged and rebranded. Um, and this is sort of a schematic of what's going on with the, back, with the, uh, the pellet itself. Where you have your, thank you. So you're going to have uh, your nitrification going on out here. And what that's doing is that's breaking down ammonia and nitrites into nitrate. And then the denitrification is where, like I said before, the bacteria are consuming the nitrate and they're converting it into nitrogen gas. So there's several benefits to biopellet use. Obviously, they're nitrate and phosphate removal. Uh, there's no need to maintain a specific dosage. You can just Basically, fill up a reactor, toss it on your tank, kind of play, you know, play it out, see how, see how the tank reacts. Um, it's very simple to use. You don't have to calculate anything really. Um, you get increased protein skimmer output, and what that's doing is, the back, as the bacteria break all this stuff down, they're consuming it, and the bacteria themselves are being skimmed off, and they're going to fill up in your 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 collection cup, and it's, you're going to see improved performance from your from your uh, your protein skimmer. And a lot of the times what manufacturers su suggest that you use is there's a little outlet here and they want you to basically put it right in front of your, your protein skimmer so that it's drawn that up. It's, it's not necessarily going back into your tank, it's going through the, uh, the protein skimmer before it goes back to your tank. Um, some potential drawbacks, uh, it's just an additional expense to an already expensive hobby. Uh, the reactors themselves, I mean, the, the, the reactors themselves are, you know, they range from 50 to 100 to 200 bucks. Uh, the bio pellets, you know, depending on the size of the bag, you get 50 bucks a bag, 100 bucks a bag. So they can be fairly expensive. Um, a lot of the, initially when bio pellets came out, a lot of the benefit that they, that a lot of people said was that they can't be over, overdosed, but that's really not accurate. Um, what happens is if you add too much, or if you do things too quickly, you're going to have way too many bacteria being produced at one time. And that may sound like a good thing, but in actuality, those bacteria are consuming oxygen at a fairly fast rate. So you can see oxygen levels in your tank just dropping off. And that's obviously bad for the larger 
aquarium life, such as fish and pools and stuff. So they need a fairly healthy amount of oxygen just to kind of swim around the tank and be active all day. But if these bacteria are consuming it all, then it's hard for them to, to do that. And some people even report that you know fish have died or, or, or what have you. Um, <clears throat> and that, that, that kind of plays into uh, the, the oxygenation kind of is where the skimmer also comes back into play. You, you dump those right into the skimmer intake, and it's going to re-oxygenate the water. So um, sort of a couple benefits of the protein skimmer use. Um, a couple other reportedly uh, have said that it affects other equipment as well, such as uh, calcium reactors, where this massive bacteria, which can actually form a very stringy substance, kind of clogs up some other equipment. So you probably won't see that a whole lot with uh, with the media reactor since everything's sort of contained, but with other dosing strategies you might you might see that down the road. Um, the Zeovit products um, kind of have a mixture of you in a lot of places. I've used this system fairly extensively for a little while. Um, in a nutshell, it's just you have the stones, which are they're zeolite based stones, and then you have a slew of additives, I mean just as many additives you could possibly think. And they're all being dosed to your aquarium and the mindset is to try to get your aquarium operating at a, at a level where all the parameters are close to natural seawater. So you know, low nitrogen, low phosphorus, uh, but at the same time you're also going to experience low calcium, low alkalinity, stuff like that. Um, the products do very well. They, they dramatically reduce nitrates and phosphates. And that's just a couple of the products. Uh, a bunch of the other stuff is actually geared towards coral feeding. So once you strip all those extra nutrients out of the water, you have to put new nutrients back in. And these are you know, amino acids and stuff like that, which are actually tailored towards coral, uh, coral coloration and coral growth. <clears throat> um, protein skimming is very important in this method as well. Um, you're going to, again, like with the bioplatch, you're going to see increased protein skimming. You're going to see uh, just more and more stuff being collected into that cup. Um, um, as you can see kind of in the, the growth chart over here, or the color chart, um, this is a, an acroporal coral that I had in my tank. Um, it's actually very nice to begin with, but it's sort of a drab color, drab blue. started using Zeovit. And it kind of got bluer and bluer, and eventually got to that pastel color that's typical of the Zeovit tanks. Um, the results are very quick with this system. So it kind of, it's better to err on the side, side of caution and take things a little bit more slowly with this setup um, because you're going to see such dramatic uh, results in such a short period of time. Um, you're going to see increased skimmer performance, like I mentioned. You're going to see amazing color, coral coloration. Uh, which the, the picture kind of shows. Um, and you're going to have an enhanced growth rate of your corals just because you're reducing the phosphates so they can still calcify very quickly and you're also feeding them so it also provides more energy for growth. Um, and one of the, the big benefits that I found was no more algae. Almost anywhere in the tank, algae was, was gone in a matter of no time. And I'm not talking about hair algae, I'm not talking about you know, the, the cyano stuff that you can get rid of, you know, but if I turn off the lights for a couple days, there was some really thick, crusty sort of algae that I just could not get rid of, but, you know, the Prodibio couldn't do it, the other stuff couldn't do it, but the, the Zeovit got it. So, it's a very powerful set of additives, um, but like I said, like, uh, it's got a lot of drawbacks. Um, it's very, very, very expensive. The bare bones sort of system for Zeovit consists of three liquid products and then the, the stones, the zeolite stones. But that's not exactly an expensive setup in itself. It's got the reactor, it's got the stones, and you replace the stones every six months or so, I think, if I remember correctly. And then you, a couple things you dose on a couple, every couple days. But if you really want to get into it, you really want to progress through the system, there's a whole, just a ton of different additives. That, that do so many different things. Some of them enhance certain colors, some of them remove certain waste products. So $50 a bottle on some of them gets really expensive really fast. Um, another major drawback that a lot of people get turned off on is, is the, the labor that's involved. 
Um, with the stones, you have to shake them up every single day. There's a little reactor, it's got a plunger in it, you just shake it uh, a couple times a day. It kind of gets all the, the bacteria off those rocks and it gets them into the tank where it can feed corals and it gets it back to the protein skimmer. So that plus the manual dosing every single day and trying to keep up with which products are dosed on which days, because not all of them are every day. Some of them are once a week, some of them are twice a week. So it's, it's kind of a lot to think about. It's kind of more intensive than a lot of people care to do. Um, it's a very complex system and it's actually fairly subjective. Just there, there's guidelines and there's different user experiences, but you follow those guidelines for your tank and some people might say, oh, you're overdosing. You get certain coral coloration that, that indicates you're overdosing. Um, so it's, it's, it's not easy to use. Um, another major drawback is it requires a fairly dramatic change in water chemistry just to be successful. Um, corals become more sensitive to higher alkalinity, so what a lot of people have to do is they have to reduce their alkalinity to, to fairly close to natural seawater levels at 7 degrees of carbon and hardness, DKH. So it kind of sucks from that perspective because a lot of people are used to running higher alkalinity levels and it means change in salt sometimes, it means change in media. It's a lot of, a lot of different changes to your system. Um, and like I said, corals become more sensitive with everything. Uh, one thing I found is if you don't maintain that alkalinity, then the corals are gonna have a tendency to just you know, RTN on you or even you know, do it a little bit more slowly. So they're definitely being affected. It's a very, it's a harsh system, but it also has very, very good benefits. It's just, Finding the, the sweet spot in the whole system is a little bit difficult to do. And Prodibio is sort of similar to Zeoga. It kind of kind of works on the same principles, except for with instead of 15 or 20 different products, you're really limited to about three uh, primary products, and there's a couple extra you can toss in if you want to. Um, it's a another uh, bacteria-based dosing system. Um, the biodigest itself is where the bacteria are. That's that's nothing but bacteria in solution. Uh, the bioptum, which they all come in these little ampules. Uh, the bioptum is what feeds the, the bacteria, so they're the carbon source. And then after you've been using the system for a while, you're gonna wanna start feeding your corals because like with the Zeobit system, you start stripping all your nutrients from your water and you're gonna have to replace something for the coral to eat. Uh, it's a relatively inexpensive setup. I think a box of additives might be 20 bucks. Um, there's a very, very flexible dosing schedule, one ampule every two weeks, or you can even stagger them so you're not dosing everything on you know, every two weeks. You're not dose one this week, one next week. And I mean, it's, it's really up to you. Uh, it's, it's not quite as a dramatic improvement as with the Zeovit. You're not gonna see these amazing results overnight or even after a few weeks. It takes a little while. Um, and uh, kind of another drawback is the solutions are in a glass ampule. I've actually cut myself on one pretty bad. Uh, they're, they're, you get to break the tip off either end and swirl it around your water. So it's not a very good delivery system, but at the same time they're sealed. They're not being contaminated by anything. Um, and. I guess I'll share a quick little story. Uh, when I worked for Bay Area, we had this insanely pink, fuzzy little algae that nothing we do could get rid of. We could break the tank down and leave it dry for a week, set it back up, and that crap would come right back. So we were scratching our heads, didn't know what to do. And this is sort of around the same time that Zio could start, I mean, Prodivio started becoming popular. So we started dosing it in the aquarium. And we threw in a couple extra algae eaters and some urchins and stuff. So. Um, and it actually worked. The Prodibio actually did a very good job of, of reducing the nutrients in the system, at least to the point to where we could not see that algae more. Eventually we fought it and got rid of it, but um, so that's my little, little story about it, my personal opinion. Um, another really popular dosing method that's kind of going on right now, uh, it's actually vodka dosing, and that's taking vodka like you get from the liquor store or even a couple other household items and dosing it basically straight to your aquarium. And it sort of serves the same purpose as the previous two that we talked about, uh, or the previous that we talked about. Um, it's just feeding bacteria. 
these two product, uh, sugar and, and vodka and vinegar and, and a couple other things, they don't actually have bacteria in them. They're not providing bacteria to your tank, but what they're doing is they're serving as a carbon source for the bacteria to feed on. And these bacteria, in turn, also consume nitrogen and phosphorus in different ways. So it's, it's an effective method. There's kind of a stringent dosing schedule with vodka. Uh, some recommendations with vinegar most people don't I mean vinegar and sugar most people don't use uh, they usually stick to the, to the vodka but there's no there's no real guidelines to this it's just kind of toss some sugar in your tank and see what happens so um, this is sort of a, a less intense less thought out sort of process but it does work and a lot of people still use it um, and basically, I found some dosing instructions online. It's not a system that I've actually used myself. Um, I just I don't keep any alcohol around the house. Um, and basically, what the ideal walkthrough of this product would be is to test your system, calculate the volume, get as much information about your system as possible. Uh, most people use 80 proof vodka, although you can go higher or lower depending. Uh, some people say that the lower proof vodkas have more impurities in them whatnot so they might cause some undesirable effects um, for the first few days you kind of want to take it really slow uh, a tenth of a milliliter per 25 gallons so for a hundred gallon tank that's not even a half a milliliter so very very minimal for the first three days you kind of double that dosage up over the next three days and then you just sort of maintain this low dosing for a while and see kind of what your, how your tank responds. See how your protein skimmer acts, see how your corals respond. If things aren't doing very well or if, you're, or if your nitrates and phosphates are still up in the air, I mean, you can kind of change things up and try to find the sweet spot in the, in the dosing system and go from there. Um, once you get to sustainable levels of nitrogen or nitrate and phosphate, you can actually start cutting the dosing back so you don't have to dose as much. Um, and still, like, like we do every day or every couple weeks or whatever, continue to test, see, where you're, see how your system's responding long term, change things up a little bit. Uh, there's a few benefits. Obviously, there's a reduction in nitri nitrate and phosphate. Um, the more robust bacteria populations that are created by feeding is basically going to be able to handle the, the excess nutrients. It's cheap. Vodka is multi-purpose, meaning you could dump it in your tank, you can drink it, you know, it's have a little fun with it or whatever. And there's no extra equipment that's needed. So you just look, shot a vodka to your tank, you're good to go. You don't have to buy any expensive reactors, you don't have to buy any, uh, anything other than really test kits. Uh, some of the drawbacks, uh, I didn't mention this, but with the bio, well maybe I did. Uh, anyways, with the bio pellets, they're in the reactor, the slime and stuff that the bacteria are producing, the actual mats of bacteria are going to pretty much stay on that media, they're going to stay in that reactor. But with sugar and vinegar and vodka, you're going to have cloudiness potentially and you're going to have bacteria slime all over the place. So it's you're, you're basically taking those bio pellets and dumping them all in your tank and just letting them, letting them go. So potential drawbacks, some people, you know, depending on how much you dose, is going to affect this more you know, than anything else. Um, a couple of people have reported that it burns the tip of SPS corals. Um, SPS are known to be very sensitive anyway, so any quick changes to their environment can cause issues. Uh, so it may not be directly tied to the vodka, but it may be tied to something more like stability. Um, and some people have actually reported browning out of their corals. So, um, again, this is not a system that I've personally used. I've just kind of heard user experience. So, yeah, I mean, it's just that's what people are reporting. I thought I had something else on there. So, that was it. Um, any questions or comments? Sure. I saw you had the picture of the Red Sea stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you know about that? Uh, I've just started using them, especially for the nitrates and the so, algae phosphates. I haven't personally used that system itself because it is so new. Um, what, from what I understand, that system is, is sort of like a complex sort of dosing and testing system that they've developed so that 
you can use a lot of their products and do you know kind of a lot of things with just their products. Um, it's going to be testing with nitrates and testing nitrates and phosphates. So like kind of, kind of typical test kit. Are you using the Red Sea stuff? Yeah. yeah, it's not. I'm using the dose of them. Like you said, against slime. Yeah, yeah. Slime's going to happen. My doesn't need to really like Um If slime's happening, I'd probably cut back a little bit just to, to see if that slime didn't go away on its own. Uh, or you could try to manually remove it with like a turkey baster or something. Do you use buckets? No. Nah. Use that VO. Do what? Use that VO. VO. Zeovit? Zeovit. Yeah, I used Zeovit for a while. It's just so cross prohibitive. That's one of the biggest things. I didn't mind the manual labor involved. I just, every time I'd come home, sprinkle a little in the tank, you know, do kind of run through the whole spiel. But it gets very expensive. Four or five additives, 200 bucks, you know, every, every couple months. It's very cost prohibitive. And for smaller aquariums, they do make the nano Zeo stuff. So, it might not be as cost prohibitive on something smaller, but if you're running anything with any volume, and it, dramatic results, you're paying for it though. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about the uh, your phosphate director uh, into the, the nitrate director uh, or the protein skimmer. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Protein yeah. skimmer. Uh, how how would you not have back pressure on that? Uh, well, it's you're not actually hooking it up. You're just Pointing the outlet to where the skimmer intake okay. is. Okay, that's what I was. Yeah, I was yeah. The same thing. I should have worded it a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually uh, mine goes through a filter sock right now after it comes out of the phosphate reactor, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm only maybe a foot from where my protein skimmer intake is, so maybe yeah. I ought to move it where it's right there at the intake. <laughs> and and the key behind that is it's the stuff that's in the reactor. It's not stuff you actually want all over your tank. I mean, some of it's going to get by, obviously, but the bacteria are what consuming the nitrogen and phosphorus. So once they leave the reactor, once they get broken off of the pellet, they become free-floating. You're going to want to remove them because otherwise they're just going to degrade the water quality after they've gotten back in the tank. Well, I'm saying I got mine going through a filter socket, kind of. Yeah. Get up the trash when it comes through there. I've also got another filter socket right over my parking seat. I just need Position. Sure. So I might miss it. Did you say there's bacteria that take care of the phosphate too? Or would you just lump them out all together? Well, the, there's bacteria that do consume phosphate. So some of these products target some of that bacteria. Mm -hmm. that's how they work. Yeah, I mean, it, you're going to get a lot of your, your, most of your bacteria reduction is going to come in the form of like GFO or uh, there's even some other polymer based items that remove phosphates. But some of the bacteria, like mostly in the zeobit system, are going to be just consuming night phosphorus at a, at a very quick rate, and that's why testing is so you can actually see kind of get down to like the 10 ppm or 10 ppb rather level, you know, with, with stuff like that. No. Sorry. Um, for the newer guys here, you can't use bio pellets and then turn around and use. You can. You can. Mm -hmm. was, I've always been told because the bio pellets themselves are only a food source for bacteria, and a lot of the manufacturers actually recommend that you dose some sort of bacteria to your tank to, di to diversify the populations. So you don't want to just have one strain in your tank going crazy because they're only going to consume so much. And you kind of want to diversify it. So adding different bacteria products to your tanks is going to be okay. You know with do vodka and the bio Yeah, well, no, well, the, the vodka itself is not a bacteria. The vodka and the bio pellets are both food sources. They're both food sources for bacteria. The bacteria is going to come from either Fredivio or there's some from Warner Marine. There's a bunch of different products out there. These are just kind of few that I've used. Um, but like I said, the, the bacteria is just feeding off of whatever the bio pellets and whatever the, the vodka is producing. I think that sort of video is like really good too if you're starting a tank up. Oh, absolutely. It, uh, anybody that's starting a tank up should get that for at least a tank startup. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, and I would you, you got to be careful. You cut, I've cut myself. <laughs> yeah, and they, they make little plastic sleeves you can put over them to break them. But I mean, yeah, it's a very good point because the Prodivio, one of its major taglines or bullet points to its use is 
cycles of programs very quickly. I still like to kind of take my time with a cycle. There's a lot of miracle products I could toss into an aquarium and you're cycled through and over and overnight. But, you know, for me, I like to take it a little bit more slowly. Those things do help the process along. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, thank Brandon for coming.